Funding for Frontline is provided by this station and other public television stations nationwide and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Tonight on Frontline, a mysterious terrorist attack that killed an American reporter. Suddenly there was what we now know as an explosion and I tried to stand up and stood up for a few seconds, I believe, and then, then just fell down, my legs gave out. I saw a big flash of light and felt immediately great pain, everything went dark. A bomb explodes at a press conference in Nicaragua. The U.S. blames the Sandinistas, but others say it was a CIA plot. Tonight, murder on the Rio San Juan. From the network of public television stations, a presentation of KCTS Seattle, WNET New York, WPBT Miami, WTBS Detroit, and WGBH Boston. This is Frontline with Judy Woodruff. Good evening. Tonight, Frontline examines one mysterious chapter in the tangled history of the United States' involvement in the war in Nicaragua, the 1984 terrorist bombing of a press conference held by rebel leader Eden Pastora at a remote outpost called La Penca. That bomb severely wounded Pastora and killed eight others, including an American journalist. The terrorist escaped. The bombing was never solved. But for the past year, producer Charles Stewart has followed the story, interviewing witnesses, gathering government documents, and exclusive videotape of the attack from Pastora's home video library. With investigative producer Marcia Vivancos, Stewart has tracked the movements of the suspected bomber, examined the motives of the possible conspirators, and investigated the failures of the official investigations. The result is a story that takes us deep into the dark side of the conflict in Central America, into the shadowy world of guerrillas, spies, and terrorists. Our program was produced by Charles Stewart. It is called Murder on the Rio San Juan. This is the Rio San Juan. On the other side lies Nicaragua. On a hot afternoon in May of 1984, on the Costa Rican side of the river, more than 20 journalists climbed aboard two outboard canoes to go up the river to cover a news-breaking press conference. They were going into dangerous territory, and the trip was not going well. They had been traveling since dawn, and they were tired. By now, the sun was going down. It was a typical contra trip, which means screwed up. Tony Avergan, a freelance television cameraman, had been up the river a dozen times before. The trip's supposed to start at uh, 6 o'clock in the morning here in Costa Rica. Uh, there was a lack of transportation. It didn't start until 11. Uh, the ride up to the place where we got the boats in northern Costa Rica was slower than expected. And we actually didn't get into the boats until uh, almost, or just about 45 minutes or an hour before sundown. For Linda Frazier, a reporter at the English language newspaper in Costa Rica, the Tico Times, this was her first trip. When she heard about the press conference, she called her editor, Derry Dyer. Ironically enough, when Linda called us the night before at 11 o'clock, she was asking whether it was worth going to, whether we should cover it or not. And she said, looks like it might be the big one. Linda and her husband, Joe, also a reporter, lived in Central America with their 10-year-old son. Joe was out of the country. Linda was eager to go on the trip. For all the danger, one reporter said the trip was like a Sunday picnic. They were going two hours up the San Juan River, the border between Nicaragua and Costa Rica, to meet a revolutionary hero who was fighting a war. 
Not knowing what to expect, they arrived on the Nicaraguan side of the river at a rebel outpost called La Panca. The river bank that we had to climb up about 15 feet high was all slick with mud. And we uh, made our way up to the top and there in the, in the dark uh, was Eden Pastora uh, reaching out his hand to shake hands with each of the, the journalists as they arrived, which for a lot of them was a, a big thrill. Eden Pastora Gomez, a former member of the Nicaraguan government, turned revolutionary, fighting against those who had once been his friends. A charismatic leader with a loyal following, but a man of many enemies. Now he was under pressure from neighboring Costa Rica to keep his troops out of their neutral territory and to call a press conference to prove that he was fighting his war inside Nicaragua. His guards relaxed as the press conference began. What they and Pastora did not know, as reporters and cameramen gathered around, was that beneath the table he leaned on, concealed at their feet, was two and a half pounds of C4 explosive. For Roberto Cruz, a reporter for a foreign news agency, it was his first time to meet the controversial leader. I had asked some question before, and uh, as I noticed that other journalists went to get close to him, and they had started putting their lights and was sort of hot, I moved one or two steps away from Pastore. I just stood there listening to what he was saying. And after I listened for a while, I, I went to get a, um, a cup of coffee and was standing at the, or sitting actually on a sack of rice at the back of the, of the small knot of journalists around Pastora, uh, drinking the, the cup of coffee, when uh, suddenly there was what we now know was an explosion. Because of its sheer force and pressure, no one heard the explosion. The cameraman taking these pictures fell to the floor. Later he would die. Another cameraman struggled to record the destruction. And I tried to stand up and stood up for a few seconds, I believe, and then, then just fell down. My legs gave out and I fell. A few feet from Abergon lay Linda Fraser with her legs blown off. And I crawled across the floor, which also was, was absolutely horrible because I was literally uh, crawling into and across parts of people's bodies. I mean, there were, there were severed parts of bodies and blood all over the floor, and the, the stench was, was absolutely terrible. I thought the Sandinistas were bombing us with artillery or mortars or something. And uh, I was lying on the floor. I tried to protect myself because I thought other bombs were going to fall. But I couldn't move. Then I noticed I had great pain in this leg. And uh, I touched something which I felt was something like a piece of wood. But it was wet. So I moved it and I noticed it, it was my bone with blood. And that it was what was left of my my leg. Then I touched my front and I noticed what was quite destroyed here. I noticed part of the eye was destroyed. I thought, well, I lost one leg and one eye. But as the, uh, as the bomb had destroyed part of the ceiling, I could see the moon and I think some branches of a tree. I, I, I thought that was beautiful and I, I thought, strange that I can s see, but maybe I thought I had died or something. Little medical help was available, and the nearest hospital hours away by boat and ambulance. 
Realizing that their commander was the target of the attack, Pastorius guerrillas rushed him away in the only boat. He would survive with a severe wound to his leg. The other victims had no choice but to wait through the night. The eight or nine hours afterwards of being there on the ground with uh, friends just a few feet away who were dying, and people like, like Linda who had both of her legs blown off and was just dying and, and was perfectly conscious the whole time and kept asking me, um, am I going to die? And I, I mean, I have trouble describing the feeling of, of how difficult, I, just my inability to say something, not to know what to say to her. The victims had no recourse but to struggle to help each other when no help arrived. Emergency calls had gone out immediately by radio and news of the explosion was broadcast in San Jose within an hour. One of the first to hear was the publisher of the Tico Times, Richard Dyer. Well, we began to re get reports rather early. Uh, this happened on a Wednesday evening, and uh, I would say about by 8 o'clock in the evening, there had been reports on the radio that the bomb had gone off at the press conference. And uh, then we began to get fragmentary reports that there were a number of of uh, uh, in injured and possibly dead at the scene of La Penca, and that's when we try started trying to get hold of the American Embassy to get helicopters or some other form of aid up to the place, up to the site of the press conference. Was the embassy helpful? No. No, the embassy did nothing that night. At the United States Embassy in San Jose, officials say they were monitoring radio reports, satisfied that the Red Cross had been alerted. We told them about the bomb, and they'd heard about that there was a bomb, and after a while, the council called back to assure us that there were no American victims, at the, no American dead at the site. Newspaper editor Derry Dyer called the embassy at 11 and was told all was well and that the deputy in charge had gone to bed. Well, we had people dying at 11 o'clock that night. Linda Frazier was dying. Curtin Windsor was the ambassador at the time. And we had no resources, really, to bring to bear. Uh, once the people got back, they were in the hands of the Costa Ricans. The Costa Ricans had good medical facilities for the region. We didn't have any medical facilities. There was nothing more that could be done, except to make certain that once they were back, they were well cared for. And that, I believe, we did. Linda Frazier died before she received any medical help. Other victims were taken to boats which had arrived to ferry them down the river to waiting ambulances. The embassy might have called upon Black Hawk helicopters stationed in Panama, but the request was never made. George Jones, the deputy in charge of the embassy at the time, said later, we are not in the rescue business. Well, it stunned us because we'd had, uh, uh, we'd never run into a case like this with an American embassy. I've been in Latin America most of my life. I've known all kinds of American embassies and a lot of emergencies, and I've never run into a similar case, a similar lack of interest like we ran into that night. I can't frankly remember uh, what I did that night or what, uh, what was done. I do know that as soon as I learned of it, I think it was that evening, uh, I, I asked that, in a, that all steps be taken to investigate it and to recover as much as could be done. Just before midnight at a hospital three hours north of San Jose, the first Red Cross ambulances arrived. They would unload their victims and return for more. The last ambulance would arrive at dawn, 12 hours after the bomb had exploded. One American journalist was dead. Two Costa Rican journalists would die within the week. One guerrilla was confirmed dead, four more unconfirmed. Anxiously waiting for word of her husband, Tony Avergon, was Martha Honey, who had driven up from San Jose as soon as she had heard about the explosion. So, I mean, I stood there at the, the whole night long at the hospital and saw these people who, you know, were, were my friends and colleagues arriving absolutely unrecognizable. And I was convinced, being a pessimist all night long, that Tony was dead. Avergon came on one of the last ambulances to arrive. 
he sustained superficial shrapnel and burn wounds to the face and hand. He began to speculate immediately about what had happened. Some of the RDA officials are saying that it was uh, brought in by uh, journalists and maybe left in a camera case or some other case that was sitting on the floor in that position. That's a possibility. The questions of what had happened now became questions of who was responsible. Everyone was a suspect. Today, Eden Pastore Gomez is retired from the war. He spends his time fishing off the coast of Costa Rica, a return to a life he knew long before he became a revolutionary leader. He bears the scar of the assassination attempt and still does not know who was responsible. To understand who wanted Eden Pastore dead is to understand who he is and where he came from. He was born and raised in Nicaragua under the government of the dictator Anastasio Somoza. When Pastora was seven, his father was murdered by Somoza's National Guardsmen. He swore to his classmates that he would someday avenge the death of his father. And in the late 1950s, inspired by new ambitions from the Cuban Revolution, he joined the Sandinista movement against the Somoza government. By the mid-1970s, now in his 30s, he stopped fishing and joined the Sandinista revolution full time. Pastora moved to the mountains from his fishing village to fight toward Managua, the capital of Nicaragua. Then, on August 22, 1978, he slipped inside the capital, still held by the dictator, Somoza, and pulled up in front of the National Palace as the Congress met inside. Firing quick bursts from their guns, less than 30 men, led by Pastora, held over a thousand people hostage for three days until they won their demand for the release of political prisoners. As Pastora and his colleagues made their way by bus to the airport and a waiting plane, crowds cheered. Pastora was not the leader of the revolution, but he was quickly becoming its star. By the time the plane left for Panama, with all political prisoners on board, his image as a revolutionary guerrilla was complete. Today, Pastora describes himself in terms of the cause he fought for. Sandinista, revolutionario, anti-imperialista. When I say Sandinista, I mean a defender of national sovereignty, defender of Nicaraguan customs, defender of a people's dignity, of a race. When I say revolutionary, I mean, I believe in structural change, in social, economic, and political change. But in freedom, I believe in freedom more than in life itself. In July of 1979, Pastora and the Sandinistas celebrated their overthrow of Somoza. And in the streets of Managua, the cry for Pastora and his pseudonym Comandante Zero was louder than for anyone else, more than for Daniel Ortega or any other member of the new government. But he was not made a full member of the new directorate. They excluded him, and he in turn criticized them for what he saw as their pretensions and arrogance. As soon as we came into power, we started to lead the same lifestyle as those Somosistas we had criticized. We went into the Somosista mansions, used the cars of the Somosistas, and led a Somosista life. And we fell into the mistake of giving the military too much power. His doubts about the direction of the revolution continued to grow, the lack of opportunities being afforded to the people, the masses he had fought for, did not match the symbol of the new man. He became so disgruntled about his own situation 
and that of the revolution, that in the spring of 1981, he secretly left his homeland. In less than a year, he was equipping a peasant army using Costa Rica as his base. He had made a deal with the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency and was secretly accepting their money to fight his own revolution against his former colleagues. Pastora quickly became a folk hero with strong loyalty from his forces and the people. For now, the South was his for the taking. CIA aid would remain a secret. Pastora would be a hero once more. This time, he would say, as the savior of the real revolution. But his U.S. supporters, the CIA, expected that in return for their money, he would join with the Contras fighting to the north. But Pastora refused, because the Contras had many leaders who were former Somoza National Guardsmen, whom he saw as the assassins of his father. His insistence on setting himself apart from everyone else caused problems. Uh, I felt the Southern Front, and I still do feel the Southern Front. While Pastora was involved with it, uh, it was a waste of the, shall we say, of effort by all involved. And uh, there is, I think, grounds for wondering about the man's motivation. He was either extremely incompetent, or he was and is a double. A man who could be a plant for the Sandinistas, or the, Cab the Cubans, or the Soviets. The CIA was so unhappy with Pastora by the time of his press conference in 1984 that they told him emphatically if he did not join with the Contras, they would cut off all aid. With enemies from the Sandinistas to the Contras to the CIA, Pastora had become a prime target. I believe that the Sandinistas did it. I think they used an element or a person or a group from the terrorist international to implement it. As evidence, Windsor points to a similar assassination attempt against Pastora headquarters the year before on the streets of San Jose. This bomb was similar in construction to the bomb at the press conference, but it had a less sophisticated detonating device and it blew up before it reached its target. The suspects were from Nicaragua. You have to bear in mind that in Nicaragua today, every ugly terrorist group in the world is represented, and it could have been any one of them. In Managua, the official response to both bombings is a curt denial. The head of military intelligence says that Pastora was too insignificant a threat for them to want to assassinate. But there was one person in Managua who might have some answers. Under tight security, Frontline was granted our request for an interview with Marielo Serrano. For two years, she was Pastora's lover and colleague on the Southern Front. Among her duties was to coordinate weapons drops with the CIA. They would set the lights in a form of a cross or a circle so that the planes would come and make their airdrops. Arms, boots, uniforms, all types of arms of different caliber, even rockets. But all the time she was with Pastora, she was working for the Sandinistas. Marielo Serrano is a Sandinista spy. Did you at any time feel that you came close to losing your life? When I felt those pressures, yes, I did. I thought the CIA must know something about me. They must be unraveling a thread behind me, and I was scared. Tell me about La Penca. What do you know about La Penca? Were you there? No. I came back a few days before it happened. After two years as a spy on the Southern Front, Marielo Serrano disappeared just days before the assassination attempt. She says she had nothing to do with it, and the timing of her sudden departure is only a coincidence. I had already been there for two years. 
The pressure is not easy. I had specific missions and all the time I was getting new ones. The length of stay was getting longer and longer. It wasn't that I could not do anymore, but they decided that I had done enough. If Mariello Serrano provided no answers to the bombing at La Penca, she only deepened the mystery. Surprisingly, Pastora does not feel betrayed by her, and he says he does not believe that she or the Sandinistas tried to assassinate him. Instead, he recalls that it was Costa Rican security officials who demanded that he call the press conference. And he thinks they were setting him up. That morning, I told my compañeros that at any time they were going to kill us. You could feel it in the air. There had been a campaign against us. The CIA had manipulated the international press to have them believe that if the unity with the Contras happened, the following day the Sandinistas would fall. San Jose, Costa Rica, like all of Central America, is a nest of spies and counter-spies from all over the world. People like Marielo Serrano come and go with few questions asked. Costa Rica is particularly easy since it is an open, democratic country. As a result, no one is ever sure who one's companion is. Diplomats mix with reporters, security officers, prostitutes, intelligence agents, and counter-espionage specialists. Investigators agree the person who planted the bomb came and went through Costa Rica with ease. This man says he has first-hand knowledge of who ordered Pastora assassinated. Rudy Sinclair is a member of the Contra movement and he says their military leader, Enrique Bermudez, asked him to help kill Pastora. Well, when he told me about those, his project, that Pastora is a big obstacle towards the Aliados project and the CIA, he says his mission definitely is to eliminate Pastora. Contra leaders who know Rudy Sinclair vouch for his reliability, but say they have no information about the accuracy of his story. He says he was asked to infiltrate Pastora's security forces, but he refused. I didn't believe in eliminating another resistant leader against this common enemy. And he said, no, 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 he said, definitely we want to give you all the support you need. Were any threats made by Bermudez? No. No. There had been only comments made by Bermudez that I had to be killed that I was a bother, I was in the way, and off-the-wall comments made by Bermudez. He thought he was still a guard with the Somoza regime. Bermudez denies to Frontline any involvement in the bombing, but Sinclair insists that the request was to help with an assassination. For me, it's like to kill them, you know, because they definitely feel like this was a big obstacle to the, they said the Aliados, that is the CIA. Pastora says that whoever the bomber is, he could not have acted alone. The Contras were one of the parties interested in eliminating me. It was impossible that the terrorist had done it alone. He needed minimal support structure, among which I suppose was John Hull. The North American rancher, the most untouchable man in Costa Rica. John Hull is an American farmer who has lived in Costa Rica since the 1960s. I, I came here 20 years ago to retire. That was my idea. I was just going to fish and hunt and uh, live happily ever after. I've never worked so damn hard in all my life. 
His 1,700-acre citrus farm is located in northern Costa Rica, near the border of Nicaragua, the Rio San Juan. Because of his geographical location and because of his strong anti-communist beliefs, it was only natural that he would become involved in the war. The CIA came here. They came to me when, uh, at the start of uh, yeah, the RD offensive, and uh, they said that uh, that they were involved in a covert action to uh, uh, that was supported by the government, and and I, I assume approved by Congress, and that uh, they were uh, in effect going to help the Artie group or the Contra group or the Freedom Fighters, whatever you want to call them, in their effort to, to against the communist regime in Nicaragua. They asked you to do what? Uh, basically, I set up or they set up with me uh, uh, an effort to get out the wounded. He took wounded out and he organized weapons deliveries coming in. Intelligence sources say he was the key coordinator of weapons drops by air to the southern front. And in this role, he worked with Pastora. I know that on John Hull's farm, my men unloaded weapons, loaded weapons. I know that John Hull gave all kinds of facilities and participated in the logistics. Hull is open about his dislike for Pastora, but he denies he had anything to do with the bombing. Congressional sources say he has been working for the CIA for the past 15 years. Hull denies this and says he has done nothing wrong in his role with the agency. I, I've been open because I had nothing to hide. I never have had. Uh, my efforts here were basically humanitarian. Uh, I did give advice to, to people and I was more or less a coordinator between uh, the, the Contra forces and the Americans. In Washington, D.C., one senator has been investigating alleged wrongdoing by the United States in Central America longer than anyone else. In those investigations, Senator John Kerry has continually run across John Hull. In hearings last fall, Hull was being accused by three former business associates of stealing their money. And Kerry was looking into allegations that Hull had also defrauded the government on a substantial loan and used the proceeds to help fund the Contras. Kerry says that Hull was the most important man on the Southern Front, coordinating illegal weapons drops on behalf of Oliver North and the National Security Council. In that role, John Hull broke the law, that John Hull and the CIA folks he was working with stepped way beyond the reaches of what Congress uh, permitted, intended, wanted, and knowingly undertook to engage themselves in a number of activities in furtherance of their self-defined patriotism, which run headlong into the Constitution and the laws of the United States. Let's deal with it for a minute. You said that drug money was being used to corrupt democratic elections. In his hearings, Kerry has investigated that, uh, illegal gun running, drug smuggling, and terrorist activities in Central America. He alleges Hull has been involved in all of these activities. There are allegations from a number of different sources that we keep running up against that John Hull has been engaged uh, directly or indirectly in acts of violence. And by the John Hull denies the all of these charges, drug smuggling, gun running, and in particular, the bombing at La Panca. ...are traitors to our country. If I had the power, believe me, I'm not an assassin. I never participated in any assassination. My work here has been humanitarian. But if it were within my power, people like Kennedy and Kerry would be lined up against the wall and shot tomorrow at sunrise because they're risking the future of what our forefathers fought for, what our people died for. The, the safety of our country is right here because if we lose Costa, if Costa Rica, we will lose all of Central America. And if we lose Central America, the ball game's over. In the tangled history of Central America, the murder on the Rio San Juan 
will probably remain a footnote. Unless someone can prove who gave the order to kill Aden Pastora. But there is one more mystery. Who followed that order? And who placed the bomb? The investigation into the bombing had begun with the return of Pastora's guerrillas to gather evidence. Neither Costa Rican nor American investigators were allowed to cross the river into Nicaraguan territory. So what clues the guerrillas would find would be critical to the official investigation. A guerrilla cameraman recorded what remained of the outpost. It was determined that the full force of the bomb had blown upward through the roof. Investigators believe someone had accidentally knocked over the case concealing the bomb moments before it exploded, saving the lives of Pastora and several others. Nevertheless, the destruction caused by the bomb was devastating. Pieces of shrapnel which had missed victims were embedded in the walls. Pastore's investigators photographed the evidence, then put it in plastic bags and took it to San Jose. All evidence was brought here to the Costa Rican Department of Justice. An American investigator analyzed the bomb parts for criminologist Gustavo Castillo. He said that was a, a, a homemade bomb with a, a walkie-talkie inside. It was a sophisticated one. Um, that he, the guy who really made the bomb, he really knows what he was doing. The investigation focused on the press corps but one journalist could not be accounted for. The Costa Ricans had neglected to close the borders for 48 hours after the bombing, and one man had mysteriously disappeared. They investigated further and discovered that 10 days before the assassination attempt, the missing man had traveled the San Juan River looking for Pastora. Investigators say that he had false identification papers and was posing as a news photographer. This is the man they say is the assassin. These pictures were taken by one of Pastora's guerrillas, who, like everyone else, thought the man was just another journalist seeking an interview. He yells at him to turn for the camera, This is not necessary, he says. Pastora remembers talking to the man by radio phone. I was 20 days inside Nicaraguan territory. Once, when I was on the radio, he came on telling me that he wanted to do a television interview with me. And that the interview would bring us a lot of money. He gave my troops cigarettes, radios, binoculars, handkerchiefs. And so he became a friend to my compañeros, to the extreme that he called them compañeros, and they called him compañero too. The name on his stolen Danish passport was Per Anker Hansen. He spoke fluent English and Spanish with no trace of an accent. Smoked Marlboro cigarettes, was well-educated, well-disciplined, and he liked to pass around a photograph of a young girl whom he referred to as his daughter. The man gave up trying to avoid the ever-present cameras and joined in the relaxed atmosphere. 
Journalists would later reconstruct his movements. He tied in with a, a Swedish TV man named Peter Torbjörnsson, who uh, uh, allowed him to come along. In hindsight, Peter was very regretful about this, but he allowed him to follow around uh, to kind of help him out. And he presented himself as a, um, a photographer, a freelance photographer for something called Europa 7. We later found there is no such thing as Europa 7. They would visit four outposts during their search for Pastora. One of them, the Lopanka outpost. As he left, the man made notes. I didn't find the person we now know as the bomber to be um, strange when I, when I met him. I, I met him the day of the bombing at uh, breakfast here in San Jose. And I actually talked to him a, a bit, but um, I didn't find anything to be particularly startling or, or unusual about him. And, um, and I, I really still don't. And then once, as we were getting into the boats up in Boca de Pata in the north of Costa Rica, we had some discussion about the um, comparative weights of, of camera equipment and uh, what we were forced to be carrying around that day. For the trip up the river, the man who called himself Hansen sat next to Linda Frazier. Frazier sat hidden behind Peter Torbjörnsson on the right. The man struck up a conversation with her. Once the press conference began, the camera caught the man slipping outside. Investigators say he walked to a point where the detonator was later found, activated the timer with a two-way radio frequency, walked back and hid behind these oil drums, while a delaying mechanism set off the bomb. Investigators say he faked injuries and left in one of the first boats. At the hospital, Dr. Max Pacheco, head of emergency services, recalls treating Hansen. Pierre Anker Hansen had no cuts of any importance. He had scratches in the front of the arms and the knees. I explained those to myself technically, as though he took a defensive position before the bomb blew up. He was a cold man, a man who did not cause any problems. He limited himself to observing. He gave an interview to a reporter and had his picture taken. He then took a taxi to San Jose, packed his bags, and left immediately for the airport. This is the last anyone will see of him. Investigators at the Costa Rican Department of Justice admit that they are prepared to handle only simple murder cases and not a well-planned terrorist attack with political overtones. They asked the Americans for assistance, but according to Castillo, those who arrived were of little help. I believe even that we, we ask for the help the United States don't want to involve too much in the matter. I mean, the detonator activating the bomb by remote control right here, was found 100 feet from where the press conference had taken place. Say, it was a critical piece of evidence, one which would have fingerprints on it. Possibly it could even be traced. It's a, a very important item. It's a very important evidence. Very, very important. Right. Castillo had the detonator, but sometime after it was photographed, it disappeared, he believes, into the hands of American investigators. That sounds very improbable. It could be that it was used uh, by the... I, I gave orders the, to make every effort to trace it. Now, we may have taken it up to Langley or to another lab to examine and trace the materials, but uh, there was no conspiracy involved. There was cooperation, and that cooperation may have involved our shipping the stuff up for careful examination. 
Down the street from the Department of Justice, the staff at the Tico Times prepared its first report on the bombing and the death of their colleague, Linda Frazier. When their paper came out that week in May of 1984, they were overshadowed by the major media in the United States. Astora is under heavy guard tonight in a Costa Rican hospital. He is being treated for injuries received when an assassin's bomb exploded last night at his rebel headquarters about a mile inside Nicaragua. Five people were killed, including an American journalist. Twenty-eight were wounded. There is still no official word about who might have planned the Intelligence sources in Washington were quick to blame the Sandinistas and went so far as to name the man who they said planted the bomb. His real name, authorities say, is Jose Miguel Lujoa, a well-known member of a Basque terrorist group known as ETA. This information surprised some reporters. So it, it didn't make too much sense, but on the other hand, we had no other clues. And so for the moment, it was sort of accepted that uh, maybe we were getting somewhere. However, it proved false when they found the suspect, the ETA suspect in Paris. But the suspect was in France at the time of the bombing, which caused some to believe that the United States government was intentionally misleading people. It certainly looks like there was an active disinformation campaign. Certainly there, there were so many leads that when tracked down turned out to be completely false. And they served to get everybody off the trail in the, in the days following the bombing. On the Tony Abagon and his wife Martha Honey continued to live and work out of Costa Rica after he had recuperated from his wounds. They were the only journalists to investigate the bombing which had turned them from reporters into victims. I want to remember it. I want to remember it very, very vividly. And I um, want to find out who did it. I'm, I'm journalistically curious and, and as a human being curious. We actually did realize that it was dangerous, but I don't, I mean, the flip side is that passivity seems so wrong. Their two-year investigation states that the bombing at Lepanka was a right-wing plot orchestrated by John Hull, the CIA, and the Contras. From the moment it was released, they came under attack. Uh, they have a long and slimy trail, the uh, Avergans, uh, beginning in Vietnam going to Africa, and then basically into Central America. And their uh, views, their reporting, what they've done has been quite consistent. It's been anti-American, pro-Soviet, pro-Soviet bloc. Honey and Avergon combined their investigation with a lawsuit filed on their behalf by Daniel Sheehan of the Christic Institute, a public interest law firm based in Washington. Together, they named 29 defendants as being responsible for the bombing at Lepanka and a series of other terrorist attacks designed to disrupt neutral Costa Rica. We know these people were involved in this thing. We know that they were setting up a, a, an operation on John Hull's ranch in Costa Rica to undertake a series of terrorist actions around Costa Rica to try to convince the Costa Rican government that they should have a strong military so that it could form a, a basic political organizing base for these people to build a strong southern front militarily against the Nicaraguan government. Yes. What did you tell General Secord was your purpose in going to Costa Rica? I was going to... The lawsuit is based on information yeah. gathered by Honey yeah. and Avergon yeah. in Costa Rica and expanded upon in depositions yeah. taken by Sheehan in the United States. Uh, you, you, got the, you got the North memo here. Sheehan claims that the terrorist conspiracy which orchestrated the Lepanka bombing is a criminal enterprise with a 25-year history covering four continents. His critics claim his facts are wrong, and if this were true, the government would have uncovered it long ago. So you see, the standards that people look to to determine whether something is true or not is very different. They want to wait for some major governmental authority to say that it's true before they believe it. We're telling them that we know that this is true, and we are going to have the courts of our country review the evidence, put it before a jury of people taken at random, and have them declare that this is true. Plausible deniability. Correct. 
Everybody I've talked to in the intelligence community and around... When the United States government investigated alleged wrongdoing in Central America and Iran, it took testimony from 500 witnesses and held 40 days of public hearings. But the Select Committee on the Iran-Contra Affair heard less than 10 minutes of testimony devoted to the Lepanka bombing and the murder of an American journalist. It came at the beginning of the hearings, as Senator Orrin Hatch questioned Rob Owen, a man who was working for Oliver North in Central America, observing and sending back reports to the National Security Council. And Mr. Owen, you were in uh, Central America in May of 1984 when a bombing attack was undertaken on the headquarters of then uh, former Contra leader Eden Pastora. Is that yes, correct? Sir. Yes, sir, I was. I was down there on a survey for Colonel North. Uh, the evening, actually, that it happened, I was uh, in San Jose. Uh, I had a meeting that night with John Hull and also with a senior CIA official in that government, or excuse me, in that country. Um, we discussed what was going on. Uh, and I just was shocked, as everyone else was, when we learned about 3.30 in the morning when some of the Nicaraguans came to the apartment and talked with us and told us what had happened. None of the men at the meeting in San Jose the night of the bombing will comment on why they were meeting or what they were discussing. But in a later deposition for Sheehan's lawsuit, Owen has said that Hull immediately called his CIA contact, who told him not to go to the site of the bombing. Hull then called another farmer in the area and gave him the same message to stay away. We were all somewhat saddened. Because any time when reporters and Americans are killed, it's always a sad time. You know, I left the next morning and flew on to Honduras. Matter of fact, Senator, if I can just say, I've been uh, named in a lawsuit in this case, which is absolutely scurrilous and there's no truth to it. Um, people have tried to say that it was the CIA that tried to kill uh, Comandante Pastora. Uh, that I don't believe is the case at all. John Hull has been accused of masterminding it or being involved in it. It's absolutely scurrilous as well. And I'm saying this under oath. I would say that there has been what some would, uh, would call a whispering campaign on at least a part of some individuals to link you with this bombing incident, and, uh, but you've uh, explained that. What's your knowledge? The only other testimony concerning the bombing came from this man, Joe Fernandez, the CIA chief of station in Costa Rica. He told Frontline that the CIA investigation was run out of Washington and that he had little to do with it. But in May of 1987, he was called to the Rayburn building to testify in closed executive session. He was questioned by Senator Daniel Inouye. The transcript refers to Fernandez by his CIA pseudonym, Tomas Castillo. Inouye asks, I am certain you must have looked into the assassination attempt on Mr. Pastora. Yes, sir, we did, responds Fernandez. We spent months trying to track down leads that we had. We were never able to identify the individual that we felt was the leading suspect. The name being discussed in the classified portions of the testimony is Per Anker Hansen. Fernandez says about the CIA investigation, our efforts have led us all over Western Europe, Latin America, and as it stands now, the case is still open, and we have been unable to identify who this individual is. Since then, unconfirmed reports have placed the suspect in Panama. The man who called himself Per Anker Hansen is today a free man. The most provocative clue to the mystery comes from two senior CIA officials who independently told Frontline that the CIA investigation, in fact, led here to the United States, to the city of Miami. They will say no more, except that the CIA investigation was then dropped and that the FBI was never informed. The CIA will not comment. At the Costa Rican Department of Justice, on the sixth floor, amidst a room filled with contraband, what is left of the evidence from the bombing at La Panca is being eaten by rats. It lies untouched by Costa Rican and United States government investigators who long ago stopped trying to find out who planted the bomb. It was, after all, said one person involved, just one more act of terrorism in the 1980s. And no one cares.
journalist Linda Frazier's body was cremated and her ashes were scattered on Mount Hood in her native state of Oregon. Her husband and her son now live in Atlanta. In Costa Rica, a den pastora is planning his return home to Nicaragua this August on the 10th anniversary of his assault on the National Palace. He recently told Frontline he now believes the bombing at La Penca was conducted by forces working with the CIA. In Miami, the Christic Institute lawsuit against John Hull, Rob Owen, and 27 others is expected to come to trial later this year. Thank you for joining us. I'm Judy Woodruff. Good night. Next week on Frontline, the unwritten rules of life for Americans in Japan. We have to play by the rules here, and uh, they're very different. In baseball or in business, the Japanese play the game their own way. Japan is a very closed society. I think a foreigner is an intrusion to that. Watch American Game Japanese Rules on Frontline. Frontline is produced for the Documentary Consortium by WGBH Boston, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Frontline was provided by this station and other public television stations nationwide, and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Educational organizations may inquire about video cassettes by calling 1-800-424-7963. For a transcript of this program, please send $4 to Frontline, Box 322, Boston, Massachusetts, 02134.